our, our first speaker is actually the reason why we are here. When I wrote to him back in winter, in March, I think, in spring, uh, I didn't have a venue, I didn't have a date, I didn't have any details, but I told him about what kind of event we want to build, and he responded with, I love it, count on me. And that was just amazing. Um, you'll find the same level of kindness and friendship when I talk to him on GitHub or other uh, places about tech. Uh, he's a core uh, Rails team member and the author of Zeitwerk. Please welcome Xavier Noria. Thank you. Uh, all right, so it's, it's a great pleasure to open the first edition of Friendly RB. Uh, bootstrapping a conference like this is not, it's not on a small tos uh, task. So uh, the organization is being extraordinary. So please give it up for the organiz organizers. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, so Adrian already said um, this. So it's going to be fast. Uh, is core team, um, author of Zyberg. I have been honored to be presented a few uh, awards uh, about Ruby. And I do that in my spare time uh, for a living. I, am a, I, I do freelancing. All right. Uh, some also remarks about Zyberg. Um, it's an autoloader, a reloader, and eager loader of Ruby code. It was published in 2020. It has had uh, about 50 releases so far. Um, it's approaching uh, 300 million downloads uh, so far. This is, uh, these are statistics from Ruby Gems. So that includes, you know, building Docker images, uh, running CI, everything. But, you know, it's, it's somewhat being used. Uh, <laughs> and it's used by Rails, by Hanami, because Zyberg, uh, for maybe um, you know only Zyberg in relationship with Rails. But Zyberg is an, is an independent project and it's been designed to work with any Ruby project. So, so in particular, other, other web frameworks. So Hanami uses Zyberg as well. And there are other, about 400 gems using Zyberg today. Okay, so uh, the, last, the last bullet is important because first, the gem is designed that, so that you, we can have multiple loaders in the same process, uh, coexisting, managing their independent source trees. So, uh, for instance, in a Rails application, there's two loaders. We normally are, you know, familiar with the, with the main one, but there's two. And if if your Rails dependency happens to have a gem dependency that is using uh, and Zyberg as well, then you have more in the same process, but they are all independent, okay? And maybe you do not even realize they are using Zyberg because one of the goals of the project is transparency. So uh, by that I mean, first in gems, you do, you do not have to document that is using Zyberg, that's internal, and you do not have to tell your users anything special about calling some special APIs or anything, you should just say, uh, uh, require my entry point, you know, that, that absolutely, you, you cannot tell from outside is using Zyberg. And in addition to that, when you use the library by, by design, uh, you, you only have to do a few calls to set things up, but then your project is your code. There's nothing about, there's no trace of Zyberg there. It's just your code, your Ruby, the way you like it, okay? The only thing is that you have to um, uh, comply with the conventions, but other than that, Zyberg is totally out of the way, and that's by design. That's, that's, that's the transparency that I wanted to accomplish. Um, now, transparency is super cool from, an, from a user experience point of view, but I, I believe it is better if this is not a black box. I, I believe it is better if you can enjoy what, what the gem does for you, but at the same time, uh, if you know what's happening behind the scenes, that's better, all right? So that's, the, what, that's what we want to uh, do in this talk, explain how it works. Um, now, Zyberg is a, is a constant, constant autoloader, eager loader, reloader. 
So in order to be able to explain how it works, we need to be on the same page about some technical stuff in Ruby. So there's going to be a first section with some remarks that are relevant to understand how things work. The first thing is that class and module keywords store classes and modules in constants. This is very unique in the Ruby programming language. So for instance, uh, we have two chunks of code. The first chunk of code, class C, is what we normally write. But what I, what I want you to know is that that thing, as far as this presentation is concerned, is equivalent to the second chunk. So it's creating a class object that's class new, and then that, that class object is stored in a C constant. So class C is doing that. Same for modules. We have module M, so that's creating a new module object and storing the module object in the M constant. So basically, the second, the second chunk is part of the implementation of the module keyword. That's the thing. It's, it's actually doing that behind the scenes, okay? Now, related to this, this is very important. Ruby does not have syntax for types. And this is, again, this, as, this aspect of the programming language is a little bit special. It's a, bit, it's a little bit unique to, to Ruby. Does not have syntax for types. Uh, let's, let's talk um, for a moment about this simple slide. We have, we store zero in a constant, constant x, and then we ask if that is even, all right? It is true, okay. Now, let's go step by step. We store this thing on x, and then in the second line, we all understand that x is evaluating to the zero that we just stored, and that zero responds to the even predicate. So this slide is not surprising, right? It, it is doing what we expect. We, we got a zero. We can ask if the zero is even. And we get uh, a, a, a value back, a boolean. OK. So very important. This and this is the same. So when we do something like this, project.find something, that is a constant. It's not a type. Ruby does not have syntax for types. All right? So it's a constant. It's exactly, exactly the same thing that we have here. So project is a constant. It stores a class object, let's imagine. All right? In the previous slide, x was a constant. It was storing the zero integer. So this is the same. It's a constant. It's giving you a class object, and the class object responds to the find method. So. When you write Ruby code and do things like this, you are using constants, not types. All right. Now, another aspect of um, Ruby that is very unique related to this. Constants is a deep topic in Ruby. So constants belong to classes and modules. That's the way Ruby emulates namespaces. So all classes and modules have internally, you can think of a hash, hash table, which is a constant, sta constant table, that uh, conceptually maps simple constant names, like no, no colon colon, just simple constant names, to their values. Okay, so every single constant that you see in the source code belongs to some module or class or another. All of them belong to some uh, namespace. And the top level ones also uh, uh, live in a namespace, which is object. So, so that x equals zero that we saw before, that one is a store in object. All constants are stored somewhere, okay? So then that namespace is you know, the emulation of Ruby, but it's more flexible than typical namespaces. That's why we have an API for constants in module, because you can, because that, that's part of the state of the, of the module object. So we can set constants on a module, we can get constants, we can list the, con the constants of a module, uh, and, and also classes. Class is a, sub is a subclass of module, so the, but, so the API is documented here, okay? But class, 
classes and modules. They, they both act as namespaces and respond to this API. So for instance, when if we do class C, as we saw before, there's a constant assignment there. There's a constant being created. And we can see it. If we list the constants, there's going to be C as a symbol, all right? And there's ellipses there. Why? We just define it C. Because there's no types. Everything is constant. So when you write a string, capital S, that's a constant. When you write hash, capital H, <laughs> that's a constant. Okay, it's not a type, it's a constant. So you would see all of them listed here. Now, I want you to see the same thing written in a different way. Because this is preparation for the implementation of Zyberg and we are going to see this used in Zyberg. So, instead of doing this, and in the previous slide we, we said C equals class new, all right? The same thing, the same thing, and we are connecting the dots, can be done with concept, because everything is the same. It's assigning a constant, a class object in a constant somewhere. So, class C is equivalent to this for the purposes of this talk. In the, second, in the second argument, we have the value. So we are creating a class object, storing the class object in a constant called C that belongs to the receiver object, all right? It's the same thing. Uh, Ruby does not care how you create the constant. Everything is the same. It's constants, uh, you know, holding class and module objects. So if, you, if we list the constant, it is there, all right? Let's, let's introduce some nesting. M is a top level constant, so it includes in uh, object constants, but now C is nested. What does that mean? That the, the C constant that is being created is a stored in which class or module object, we have all, always to ask ourselves which is the class or module object that should have this constant? Well, in M, okay? So if we list the constants of M, we are going to see that C, all right? Now, again, I want, I want us to see the same thing written in a different way, preliminary to what we are going to see. So this is equivalent for the purposes of this talk to this, okay? So we are creating a module object, the second argument, the first line, assigning that module object to the M constant where in object, right? Now, the second line is interesting because we are creating a class object whose name, so, so the, the name of the constant is C, stored where? In the M module, all right? So everything is located in one particular class or module object. Uh, it's also worth to highlight that after the first line, we can use the M constant in the second line. You see, the receiver is an, is an M constant. Why does it work? I, I, didn't, I didn't have a module keyword. I didn't have a, a constant assignment. Yes, there was a constant assignment in the first line, all right? Everything is doing the same. So what does that mean? That you can right away use the M constant. But how does, how does that work? Ruby has a constant lookup. There are uh, several algorithms. We are not going to see them. It's not relevant for this, for this talk. But when, when Ruby sees this M constant, says, okay, I'm going to find look and find this constant in some uh, class of modules that we, I have in my look at path, doesn't matter. So in this particular case, says M, do I have a constant in object? Yes, you have it. Give me the value, continue, right? So you can use it right away because this is the same. Finally, and this is the key to Cyberg, there's an API to autoload constants. Okay, so autoload allows you to load constants on demand. For instance, this is real code from background. Um, in background, if you open the entry point, you will see that there's module background and then there's a set of autoloads. Autoload, action, and there's a string there. Autoload, alias, and there's a string there. What does that mean? It means whenever the lookup algorithm is looking for an 
action, for instance, constant in the background module, if the constant is there, uh, it's, a, it's a regular expression, no problem. But if the constant has not been loaded, then Ruby itself is going to do a require on the second argument. So a require background slash action. Hopefully, that's going to define background colon colon action. So action inside the background module. All constants belong to some module or class object. So in this case, background module. And then if, you know, if everything is good, uh, once loaded, the program is going to resume. So what's the point here? The point here is that you do not have to write one single require. So maybe background action, I don't know. But let's imagine that it's used in, in, I don't know, in 20 files, okay? If you do not do this, you need to put a require for background action. If you want to cherry pick, you have to be very careful that every single file that, that uh, uses that constant has the corresponding require. But if you write an auto load like this, you can forget about that. No requires. Because you can use background action anywhere. If it was loaded, fine. Otherwise, the auto load is going to be triggered and it's going to, be, it's going to work. And that's the key thing about Zyberg. Zyberg puts auto load for you. Now, again, I want to present the same thing in a different, slightly different way. So this autoload is a method, right? A method, call it on one, on, 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 on what? If there's no explicit receiver, we know that the receiver is self, all right? So it's self.autoload. Who is self? The background module in the body of the module definition. So this is doing the same thing. Instead of self, we are putting an explicit require, uh, explicit uh, receiver, sorry. So it's background dot auto load, the same arguments, okay? This is the same call, only explicit. We are going to see this also in the implementation of Zyberg in a moment. All right, those were the preliminary remarks. We are ready, all set to start looking at Zyberg source code. So the source code in the following slides has been heavily edited, all right? So, uh, the, the, the goal of the talk is to understand essentially how Zyberg works. Then there's eight cases and there's uh, many, uh, the, uh, Zyberg is about 1,000 lines of code, okay? There's, there's many other auxiliary things that have to be, you know, considered to have the gem, you know, uh, in production, let's say that way, you yeah? know? But, uh, doesn't matter. So for, for, for the goal of understanding what Zyberg is doing for us, uh, we are going to see essentially the, the key points, okay, of the implementation. Now, uh, this is the way you use Zyberg in an arbitrary project, all right? The API is very simple. The project has to comply with some uh, naming conventions, okay? But you, you instantiate a loader and you say, these are, these are my root directories. These are the directories where, uh, you know, the top level, they represent the top level namespace, okay? By default, that is an object, which is, corresponds to what is the top level namespace in a normal Ruby program. You can pass optionally uh, another namespace if, if you want, but uh, let's simplify, let's imagine this is object, which is the default, and it's what this slide is doing, okay? So you say, uh, okay, this is, these are my top level, and then we call loader setup, and that's it. You don't have to do anything else. The, the project is ready to auto load, eager load, whatever you want, any, anywhere, right? Okay. So the meat of the thing is in setup, because after setup, everything is done, all right? Uh, in Rails, you do not have to do this. Why? Because Rails has a, a code that integrates the Rails interface with Zyberg. Okay, so, it's so in, in Rails, there's the concept of autoload paths, and uh, basically, there's some glue code when, when the application boots that says, okay, I'm going to take the autoload paths, 
uh, instantiate a driver loader, push dir, push dir, push dir, set up. That's, that's done by you, so you don't see this, okay? And in gems, normally there's only one root directory. If you use driver in a gem, normally you only have lib, okay? But the generic interface is this one, okay? And in Rails, we have several directories, and that is going to allow us uh, to see the generic, gener genericity of uh, the interface. All right, so that's all you have to do. Right? Then the rest of your, is your project the way you want it. Let's see how do we autoload. And this is going to be the big section, how autoloading works. That's why, uh, that's because, uh, as you are going to see, eager loading and reloading is kind of a corollary of how autoloading works. So this is going to be a big section, and then eager loading and reloading is going to be very short. All right. So before we explain how Zyberg does this, we are going to first, with an example, see what is going to happen, what we would like us to happen. So let's imagine our project has these files, okay? Has a user's controller, then it has a namespace admin with a roles controller. <clears throat> In models, we have user and admin role. Let's imagine we have this small project, all right? Remember, app controllers is one root directory. App models is another root directory, all right? But <clears throat> they represent the top level namespace. So for instance, user.rb, as usual, uh, means uh, we expect that the top level user constant is in that sense that they, are, they represent the top level namespace. This is what is going to happen. So it's the same thing that back background was doing. In object, which is the top level namespace, we are going to set, we are going to define autoloads. So there's going to be an autoload for users controller, written that way, with the full path to the file. There's going to be an autoload for user, same, full path, and then, curiously, there's going to be an autoload for the namespace, with a full, pile, a full path of one directory. This is a little bit weird. We are going to understand why. Let's focus on the first two, okay? So this is, if you, if you did not want to write requires like background, uh, you, could, you could, you know, open a file and add autoload. If you, in the project later, you do, you, you add more files, you add autoload, you remove, you have to maintain the list, okay? But you can do this manually. This does not resolve uh, reloading, but for autoloading, it's enough. That is, that is what Zyber is going to do on our behalf. Let's see how does it do that. Oh, let me remark as well that there's no roles here. The roles controller and role is not here. Because in order to be able to reach them, first we need the admin module. So by now, we have like one level the files, and then one level. The, the subdirectories are going to be autoloaded, okay? It's lazy, all right. Uh, so, setup is a loop. We have root directories, and in the same order they have been pushed, that, that, is, why, that is why the interface is pushed here. So the internal structure of root di directories is not public. You do not, so it's not an structure that you mutate. That's on purpose. You push, and that uh, that tells you that tells the user of the library uh, that is going. There's going to be a, an order implicit, the, the order in which you push things. All right. So the internal the internal collection is root dears. All right. We are going to see a lot of uh, internal APIs, eh? private APIs. Okay. So root dears, we are going to iterate through them. This is important. We, we uh, process the root directories as they are pushed. Then, for each one of them, we are going to call this method, define autoloads in this directory for that namespace. That namespace is object, all right? In our simplified example. All right. This method is Somewhat simple indeed, okay? So now we want to set autoloads for one particular directory, 
and one particular namespace. In our example, we have been called it two times. One for APP controllers with the namespace object. And then when we are finished, we are going to be called in the outer loop for APP models with the object namespace as well, okay? So we are in one of them now. LS is an internal utility that yields files, uh, stuff that is uh, relevant for the loader. So it skips a lot of things. LS is used internally in several methods. And for instance, uh, it skips anything that does not have an RB extension. So you can have uh, JavaScript files, CSS files, whatever mixed it in a directory is going to be fine. And Zyberg is going to ignore them. It also skips uh, hidden files. So if you have, for instance, .ds store in, a, in, in Mac OS, it's going to ignore that file, it's going to work. So it only yields what is relevant, all right? And now we have a branch for files and another one for directories. If, if we get yield a file, we are going to do something. If we get yield a directory, admin is going to do something else. Right, for files, every loader has an inflector that from a, from a file name is going to give you the constant name expected to be defined in that file. This inflector is independent of any other inflector. Every, every loader has 100% control or of its inflections, okay? So we ask the, lo the, the inflector, please caramelize this file name. In the case of users controller, users underscore controller dot rv, everything lowercase, this is going to return a symbol. The symbol is users controller with capital U, capital C, no underscore. That's C name, okay? I have um, uh, some, co some naming conventions internally, so C name is constant name. So it's C something normally is a variable that is uh, related to constants, but since everything is constants, I need a vocabulary that is uniform in, and is short and concise. So C name is constant name. We get the constant name for that file. Okay, we are working with files. And now you see the call that we saw before in background. In object, the name is space that is, you know, passed. In object, we are going to define an autoload for the constant name pointing to the absolute path. That's it. Here is the autoload. So this is automated for us. Well, what we could write by hand is being automated. And that's an, the nice thing when you know how things work. Because it's like, okay, I could do this by hand, and I know what it's doing. Please, do it for me, you know? But you're in control, you know what is happening. So it's, it's setting an autoload, that's it, you know? Um, it's in, it's, it's uh, interesting that this absolute path is always an, uh, a full path, it's an absolute path. The point here is that we know which is the file. So if you use a relative name like background action, um, Ruby is going to do a lookup of the file in, in, uh, in, the, in a collection called low path. Okay, so when you say require no kogiri, so basically Ruby has conceptually, at least conceptually, has to go through the directories in load path and see whether there's a no kogiri there. There's a lookup. But if you pass an absolute path to require there's no lookup, it goes straight to the file, loads. So that's more performant and, and Zyber has performance uh, uh, in mind all the time. So it's always an absolute path. Indeed, these directories do not, do not have to be in load path. And in Rails 7.1, the autoload path for the first time are not going to be in the, in, the, in the load path by default because we don't need it. Then the second chunk is some housekeeping. This is important. L later we are going to use this. So we remember, this is private API as well. Everything is going to be private API. So we remember in this autoloads hash, we are going to remember that we set an autoload for that thing. This is internal state. And also we are going to register in a global uh, registry that the gem has internally that, that self, the current loader, is managing that particular file, all right? So this is internal. We remember the autoloads that we have defined it. And also we register that the loader is responsible for that file and we are going to see later why. 
No, that was the, the file case. Let's see what happens with a directory. Same thing, we camelize, we get a C name, and then uh, namespaces de defined by, by directory can be a spread. As, as we saw in the example, if you have multiple root directories, you can have uh, the same subdirectory repeated in all of them, or in some of them, or only once. But the point is that it, you, can have, you can have the definition spread over multiple subdirectories. So uh, if this is the first time we see this directory, uh, it says unless namespace autoload, unless, unless we already set an autoload for this thing, we are going to set an autoload, all right? But in the rest of, of in the rest of occurrences, we don't need to do that because it's already done. So we have to do this only once. We set an autoload on the directory, as we saw before, okay? Again, a namespace autoload call is setting autoloads for us. Then the same housekeeping, we, re we remember this and we register this. And finally, another state, we need to keep track of which subdirectories define that particular namespace. So that's the bottom, the bottom line, namespace dears, okay? So uh, when we hit the admin, um, uh, we want to autoload the admin module, we are going to remember in, with thanks to this structure that admin is defined in app controllers, there's some stuff, but in app models there's also some stuff. So we have to remember we have all these directories to visit, okay? That's it, that's set up. It is setting auto loads. So let's recap, okay? The loader has scanned the root directories only one level. So Zyberk is lazy. If, it, if you have thousands of files, doesn't matter, it's going to do one level only, right? Has scanned the root directories. Then auto loads have been defined, but they are not triggered. So it's only the declaration, it's only the definition. It has set auto loads, that's it. The setup call that we saw at the beginning, no returns. That's it. Uh, it may be surprising, but that's all you have to do. And you can, at this point, autoload anything, no matter how deep in the project, by only scanning one level, all right? So it's super lightweight. Now, the loader stops and waits. It does nothing. You, the, the program starts running. Your library starts loading. Uh, your Rage application starts serving requests, whatever. So the loader at this time is, okay, done, ready, right? When are auto loads executed? As you use the code. Maybe you do not hit all the constants, fine. Maybe you hit, for instance, in, de in, in, de in development, maybe you hit a few and the other 2,000 are not hit. Doesn't matter, okay? So as you use Ruby, because the autoload in the end is executed by Ruby. Ruby is going to do that logic that we explained it before. If the constant is no loaded, oh, I have an autoload, fine, go require, you know, and load. So, how do we keep track of this? Because we need to uh, know what to unload, we may need to run callbacks, there's stuff to do. We need to keep track of the autoloads, but the autoloads are executed by Ruby. That's out of the workflow of, of the library. So Zyberg defines a thin wrapper around require, so all requires go through Zyberg. And now we see why we need the registry, because the first thing, so all requires go through this. If you do require Nokogiri, it's going to do through this. There are a few gems that, that, uh, that are like very, like whose main thing is loading, like Ruby gems, like Bootsnap, and Zyberg itself, that, that they have their own thin wrappers around require, right? So, if the registry says, I have a loader for this file, we, we got the loader, we are going to do something. Otherwise, just call the original require and return its flag. But if there's a loader managing that file, then we intercept this call. Say, okay, this is mine. 
Let me do some housekeeping. Again, we branch if it's a file of, or a directory, right? So if it's a file, we call the original require, so Ruby, Ruby is going, we, we, we do not do anything special. Let, let Ruby do its thing. We call the original require, we keep track of the flag that require returns, and if the flag is true, which means the file was actually loaded, then we are going to do some housekeeping. That callback on file autoloaded is internal, all right? And in any case, we are going to return the flag that, that the original require returned to comply with the contract of require. So what does this um, internal callback do? Well, it's very simple, very simple. Uh, we, in the autoloads collection, the autoloads collection, remember, is that collection that keeps, we, we store the autoloads that we define it. All right, so when we define an autoload, we, we keep track of that in that collection, autoload. So we delete from that collection, we delete the entry that corresponds to that file, delete it. We got a CREF, a CREF is a pair, it's a name, name space and constant name. It's, a, it's an array of two elements, okay? It's, it's constant reference, right? The, the thing is that we delete the entry, and then if the expected constant was defined, so if the expected constant was not defined, we raise, okay? This is simplified, but the actual race has a message. Uh, I, I expected this constant to be defined in this file. Uh, it was not. Here's the things that you can do to fix this, okay? But in the, in the, in the happy path, uh, the only thing that we have to do is, if reloading is enabled, because you have to opt in to reload, why? Because reloading, if you, th if you, if you think, is like, uh, it's, it's an important use case, but uh, when you are in production, you do not reload. When you are de developing a gem, you normally you do not reload. When you there's no service running. So when you develop a gem, uh, you, you edit the gem and, and perhaps run the, the test suite. That's it, you know, so you do not need reloading. So we need reloading when, you are, when we are in, in development mode, indeed. So uh, if we do not have reloading enabled, we can save memory, performance, always, always performance in, uh, in mind. So if reloading is enabled, then there's a state that says, hey, uh, we autoloaded this. Uh, if we get asked to reload, we, we will need to unload this, okay? So we keep track of the things that have been autoloaded in that true unload hash. Okay, so this is when a require of a file happened, this is what is happening. Basically, not, not a lot of things, okay? There's more things in the real code, but the essential thing is this simple. Now, done. What happens with a directory? Even easier, because uh, we do, we do not, we do not uh, call the original require because there's no file to load, so the original require is, was going to, this is the, the, the directory, what do you want me to load here? So uh, there's no call to the original require. So this is a uniform interface in the, in, in the sense that all files and directory, directories work the same way internally, and that allows us also to uniformly uh, do an order descend only on demand, okay? And the way we accomplish that is that is intercepting required for these directories that we set. So again, we're going to do some housekeeping and we're, go we're going to return true because we control the flag. But no call to the original require. Now, what does that do? Well, there's a little bit more to do here, but not a lot. So uh, we get the CREF, we also delete from the autoload path. So the autoload paths, as you see, the autoload paths get, get entries when we are scanning, but then when things are used, the, the, you got deletes. So it's, you know, it's uh, uh, increasing and then decreasing. So we, we keep always uh, memory, you know, uh, you know, under control, right? So when, when anything is autoloaded, uh, the autoload paths uh, gets the entry deleted, so we know also that we, we do not have anything to do with this thing anymore. So we can delete and keep memory in place. All right. Uh, 
Now, the important part here is, is this line, this is strange call here in the middle. That's a concept. If you remember from the first half, concept is defining a constant in a certain class or module. And that's, so, so we, we do not have an admin .rb file with module admin n. We do not have it. The directories are in auth, so who is creating? Because in the end, we have a module. We, who, this line is creating the, the, the module, okay? And this, here we have condensed everything we have seen. So this concept is saying, give me a module object, the second argument, assign that, the, the, the CREF, the CREF, remember, is a, is a pair, name is space, constant name is a symbol. So the second, the second uh, element of the array is the symbol, okay? So in that case, is admin in the example. So is create an, a module object, assign that module object to the admin constant that is stored in the, in the first element of the CREF that in our example is object. But this is generic, this could happen you know, uh, deeper in the project. So that, that's what is creating the module on the fly, the admin module on the fly. You do not have to do it. Again, if reloaded is enabled, we remember to later uh, uh, be able to unload this. And then uh, we need to visit. We, we, we stored the, the several directories, potentially, that are defining the name space. It, it's, it, in, in, in the general use case, is a spread. So now, and here's the recursion, here's the recursion. So now we visit all those subdirectories, okay, the, the, the subdirectories here, we have mod is, the, mod is the module that we just created, mod. Okay, so now we, we are in the admin namespace. We, we are starting the recursion. And now we call the original method. But now, with the subdirectory and the name space, which is deeper. So it's the same thing again. We are going to scan and set auto loads. So we are, after, this, uh, after this call, we are going to end up with something like this. The module admin is going to be defined dynamically. And now that we have the admin module, we can set auto loads for roles controller and role. That's, that's what is doing, all this code is doing for directories. All right, so a summary of this. It's been a little bit dense. We scan the root directories. First thing, there's a loop. Then we define auto loads one level, one level of auto loads for files and subdirectories. Then do nothing, just wait. When things are triggered, we we intercept this, this uh, auto loads via require, but that, that thin decoration, we intercept them. Then uh, modules are created on the fly, as we have just seen. And for those particular modules, we do recursion. So that recursion is again, one level only. And if you think about that, we are discovering the project as it is used, so we do at the first, the first time we do a scan one level, but after that, we only go down through the branches that are used. The rest of branches are ignored. Well, they are passive, they are potential, okay? But if you do not use them, the loader is not going to go down those ones. So it's as efficient as it can be. Only visits the things that are used and only one level at a time. One more thing, there's there's a, there, uh, there's a uh, situation that was uh, actually difficult to, to solve for me when, when I was working on this in 2018, and I copied the, the technique used here from another project. So there's files, the admin, the admin uh, module, the admin namespace was not defined in a file, but we have namespaces that are defined in files, and that creates a problem. The problem is that, uh, for instance, we have here hotel, and the hotel includes a mix in. Let's, Im let's imagine everything related to pricing has been structured to a module, which is in the second part, okay? The module is defined there. Okay, uh, we have a problem here, because 
we cannot, we cannot require hotel because in order to be able to require hotel, we should have the pricing constant defined. But the constant, def the constant is in another file and we, cannot, we, cannot, we do not have the constant. On the other hand, if we try to, okay, let's first require the second file. Well, you cannot because in order to, in order to um, load the second file, we need the hotel uh, module define it, or the hotel class in this case. The, the name is space. You see, because it's there in the module keyword. So we need it. So we cannot load any of the two. What do we do? All right, so if, if we had to do this manually, there's a way out, manually, all right? The way out is this. When, when you define the hotel class, you set an auto load in the body for the um, module, all right? And then you use it. It's a little bit strange if you had to do this manually because maybe, I don't know, uh, you, you maybe do just a require at that point for the same price, okay? But technically you can do this, all right? If we put the auto load inside the body, then we can ref refer to the pricing constant right away. Because when we reach the line, hotel is defined and we have the require for the constant. Okay. So that's, that's what we are going to do in this situation if the project has what we call explicit namespaces. An explicit namespace is a namespace that is defined in a file, all right? Okay, so. Zyberg um, um, internally registers that there's an explicit namespace and the trick to solve this, because we want to put that auto load inside the body. We want to do this. Zyberg is going to do this. But Zyberg is transparent, so there's no, there's no, it is not going to edit the file, for instance. Or it's, it's not going, that was a possible solution, but it, I didn't like that solution. You could have uh, an API call, you know, you, Zyberg could, could, could have API call that says, okay, please, uh, this is an explicit namespace, go and, and do your work. But I didn't want that. I didn't, I, what I wanted is that your code is your code. Zyberg is nowhere. So I wanted to do this dynamic, dynamically somehow. The, the technique that Zyberg uses to do this is trace point. So trace point is an internal, well, an internal, not an internal, but um, let, let's call a somewhat technical uh, API in Ruby, okay? That is able to call you when certain events happen when the program runs. Okay, you can be called whenever a method is called, for instance, and you get metadata about uh, that call, which method, you know, from, you know. So there's an, there's a, a, an event that is uh, triggered when a class or module uh, object is created using the class or module keywords. That's the class event, okay? Despite the name, it also works for modules, okay? So when the class, when a class is uh, created, if we, if we know that class is an explicit namespace, if it is not, uh, do nothing, okay? But if it is, and that's the registry call we saw before, then we are going to call that callback that we saw before for directories, which is, okay, now set the auto loads for the subdirectories. It's the same call that we, what we saw before. So we are on time here, here we are called, we are called right after the class keyword. So we are on time to set that auto load dynamically. That's what this code does. And also performance in mind always, uh, this trace point has no, we have not been able to measure any overhead of this trace point call because it only happens with, with, when a class is uh, created with a class of module keyword or module, uh, but that's, you know, in the execution of a program that only happens a few times, statistically, and so there's no overhead. However, uh, we, since we keep track of which explicit namespaces we are waiting, if there's no explicit namespace waiting, because either one, there's no one, or if there was one, we loaded it, then we even disable the, the trace point, okay? All right. So that was auto loading. Now eager loading is going to be faster because to eager load, 
we iterate through the root directories and we call eager load there. Okay, so again, it's a loop and for each one of them, we are going to do something. Uh, this is uh, like a recursion, but written in a procedural way. So we have a queue and the queue starts with the root directory and object, okay? So we want to eager load that directory and that's the namespace that corresponds to that directory. Now we have a while loop that says, okay, give me the first element. So after the, in the, in the you know, when we start, that, that is going to uh, uh, exhaust the queue. The queue is going to be empty. And if we eager load, we have uh, again the ls utility and we branch files and directories. If it's a file, and this is something that I, I like very much about the implementation of Jiberg, because Jiberg, in a sense, uh, uses itself. So you could think that eager loading is a recursive require. It is not. It has a recursive auto loading. All right? So everything, everything is connected so that eager loading can be auto loading. It's a nice property of the, of the, of the library, I believe. So if you, you, we have this collection, auto loads, and remember this collection uh, is, is rings as we use things. So, if we have an autoload pending, okay, so it's an autoload pending, which means there's an entry in this collection, we are going to do a cons get. Okay, C get is a cons get. So, a cons get is going to autoload. Now, when we cons get, we are going to load that file. But maybe if we have mixed scenes or whatever, you know, that's going to have side effects and autoload of the things. So you see, it's, it's autoloading all the time. Okay? Maybe a side effect is going to autoload of the things. Since we delete on the re when, when we decorate require, since things that are autoloaded are deleted from this autoloads collection, what happens is that we are going to autoload only what is pending. So if we are scanning the project and the, the autoload for this was already executed, we do not do anything. It, it grows and it shrinks. Super simple. If it's a directory, uh, we need the namespace, so we compute the namespace, and then we push the namespace to the queue. So as this directory corresponds to the, names, to the namespace, please do the same thing. All right? So, summary of eager loading. That's all eager loading, all right? The main part is autoloading because as you see, eager loading is autoloading. So, it's a breadth first project traversal. We go layer by layer. We trigger the autoloads in each level and we ignore the stuff thanks to this state that we are you know, keeping. We ignore anything that was loaded before as a side effect. And finally, reloading, also super simple because everything is uh, set up by the, by the autoloading. In autoloads, we have the things that have been defined for us and, has not, and have not been triggered, okay? Again, we delete. When, if we autoload, we delete from that collection. So anything in that collection has not been triggered. Um, so what happens? To be clean, you have to delete those autoloads. Because <clears throat> if you change the, 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 the project, and for instance, deleted the file, if we leave that autoload set in object, that's, that's not correct. That does not reflect the state of the, of the file system. So the, the, the clean thing to do is to remove the autoload. There's no API to remove autoloads, like with autoload in the name, but <clears throat> if you remove a, a, the constant, if you say remove const, that removes the autoload because in a sense, uh, Ruby in the API does not distinguish a lot what only has an autoload from what has been actually autoloaded. All right. So that is removing any pending autoloads that were not triggered, the first chunk. Remember, when we autoload something, in, you know, when we go through the require, if reloading is enabled, um, we keep track of what was autoloaded. And that's in the to unload collection. We need to unload all this. And it's the same thing. We remove the const 
from the from the namespace. And then loaded features is um, an array of the Ruby files that have been required. If we leave loaded features as it is, and we reload and we set auto loads and that triggers requires, those requires are not going to load the file. Because as far as Ruby is concerned, that file was loaded, is in loaded features. It was loaded by the previous execution. Okay, so we need to tell Ruby, uh, all right, you, okay, you al already required this file, but let's forget about that. And that's that, that, delete, that delete call. Okay, so for files, we delete the absolute path from loaded features. That allows us to require again. No, everything has been unloaded. The constants have been removed, because Ruby does not have API to remove objects from memory. The constants, so everything is noted in a way that if, if the project is set up correctly, what happens is that those class and objects were stored in constants. Since the constants are gone, no, those objects are not referenced anywhere. What happens then is they are going to be garbage collected. They are not reachable anymore. Okay, so it's in that sense that we are unloading. We are removing the only, we are removing every, the, the places where the objects were stored and therefore they are going to be garbage collected. And then after we do this, these simple loops, we call setup so we start over again. So summary of reloading, we remove the non-triggered autoloads, we remove the autoloaded constants, we delete the, load file, the loaded files from loaded features, and run setup again so we start all over again. So that was it. It was a pleasure to open the conference. I hope you liked the talk and I hope we enjoy the conference a lot. Thank you. Thank you.